Today's webinar presentation is titled Exploring Civicultural Strategies in Our Changing Forests, looking at spruce fir. Our presenter today is Bob Seymour. Bob Seymour is the Curtis Hutchins Professor of Silviculture in the School of Forest Resources at the University of Maine, where he teaches courses in silviculture, the ecology and management of the Acadian forest, and forest stand dynamics. He holds a BS in forestry from Ohio State University and an MF and a PhD from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He has over 35 years of experience in research and management of the forest in the Acadian region of Northeast America, Northern North America, and directs the long-term Acadian Forest Ecosystem Research Program. He has authored or co-authored over 90 publications and five book chapters on civil cultural subjects. He is a Society of American Foresters Fellow and has won numerous awards, including the Sh Carl Shank Medal for National Excellence in Forestry Education in 2014 and the David M. Smith Award given by the National, by, excuse me, by the New England Society of American Foresters for Civil Cultural Leadership in New England in 2015. We're fortunate to have him join us this morning. And with that, I'll go ahead and welcome Dr. Bob Seymour. Thank you, Kate, and welcome everybody. This is a new one for me. Um, I'm used to looking at all you people out there instead of at my own slide on the screen, but we'll see how this goes. As many of you probably realize, I teach a graduate course in this. Done that since the 1980s, and there's 10 three-hour lectures in it, so there's, I've been challenged uh, to focus 30 hours of material into 45 minutes here, so we'll see how we do. It will be necessarily uh, shortened and we will leave some things out. What I've decided to cover um, is uh, basically uh, looking at the silvics and ecology very briefly of our species, successful re uh, regeneration, how we do that, a little bit on production forestry, uh, and then probably be, uh, then wrap up with some contemporary ideas about managing with irregular syst shelter wood systems under an ecological forestry paradigm. So thank you all for tuning in, and as Kate said, make sure you type in your questions, and we'll see if we can do it. I've made a note, we're not going to talk about the spruce budworm. I mean, I'm fairly capable of doing that, and we could go on for hours on that, and if you want to do another one later on, I, I, I would present that. But if we get into that, nothing else, well, we won't get into the silviculture here, so <laughs> save those budworm questions for me another time. The Acad what is the Acadian forest? Well, it's this region that really coincides very well with red spruce, right? It goes from the Adirondacks over here in uh, upper northeastern New York over to Nova Scotia and up into, into southern Quebec. Um, the signature species, red spruce, um, is a remarkable tree. Here you see two extreme examples of its development. You know, old growth, beautiful 300-year-old-plus uh, mountain spruce over in western Maine that may well have started as an umbrella tree, just like we see here on the left, uh, and everything in between, uh, just the signature species. It's very tolerant of shade. It lives a very long time, over 400 years has been documented. It persists a very long time as advanced regeneration, which is a critical uh, silvical property. Its uh, seedling establishment on the other hand, when it's first starting out, is uh, it, it, the seedlings are fragile, seed crops are infrequent, so that's it's basically its weak link. And uh, so we need to address that in management. Uh, it's ubiquitous over the landscape, except for maybe very wet sites. It's not really very responsible, responsive, that should say, to site gradients, okay? It has very few pests. This is one of its great strengths. In contrast to its, of course, major associate here, balsam fir, they're also very tolerant, but much more limited longevity. The classic species uh, that we think about of the concept of pathological rotation. Um, it also persists as advanced regeneration, maybe up to 50, 40, 50 years. See, where it's strong, of course, is at its early establishment. We get uh, you know two-year seed crops. The seedlings are robust and established readily. So it's first, we often find, of course, areas dominated by fur regeneration with almost no overstory left alive. Well, it's, that's its habit. It's also quite ubiquitous over the landscape except for droughty soils and highly responsive to site gradients. It's an excellent species to use for site index determination. Um, it's got all kinds of pests, both uh, pathogens and uh, insects. It's so highly s subject to stem rots. The spruce budworm, of course, is its major host and the balsam woolly adelgid is becoming a serious problem here. 
So the challenge in spruce fir silviculture with these two species is, the way I put it, is to favor this, the spruce, at every opportunity you can, recognizing that you're always going to have plenty of this. Um, if you just give up and assume you're going to just have fir or hardwoods or whatever, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, you know, these hard-to-manage species like red spruce, we need to direct attention to. So that's hopefully what I'm going to focus on here, briefly at least. So how do we manage the early establishment and competition phase here? Um, if we're trying to keep the forest type intact, you know, in the words, keep our tolerant conifer association uh, dominant on the landscape over earlier successional hardwoods, which will tend to take over if we don't, if we let them, um, then just something like a shelterwood system will, will work just fine and we'll cover that just down the road here. If we're, on the other hand, taking, trying to favor spruce over fir, we got a much more difficult problem. This is not so easy. Uh, you can't just manipulate the overstory. That's not sufficient for reasons I'll show. You need to do a, you know, a series of entries at all stages during the rotation. Pre-commercial thinning is very helpful. We'll show examples from the Penobscot Forest. Also, man, another important concept is managing spruce on longer rotations than fir, given, and because we can do that, because it is long-lived. Okay, regeneration. Um, now, the, I always go back to what I call the Bible. This is Marinus Westfeld's 1931 monograph that he wrote after studying spruce for regeneration in the teens and the 20s, all throughout northern New England after the early era of heavy pulpwood cutting. And the single concept he distilled was this critical importance of advanced regeneration okay, to the success of this tree. And what is advanced regeneration? These are seedlings and saplings that are present in the understory prior to or in advance of, hence the term, the final removal harvest or some natural disturbance, canopy replacing disturbance or at least a gap, right? So they have to be there before the disturbance, okay? They come in in the shade. So this is silviculture. This is basically a shelter with process. And it's important to stress that this includes what uh, we sometimes call the one cut variant of the shelterwood method where we just remove the overstory to release advanced growth without any prior entries. Those are not clear cuts silviculturally. Those are shelterwood removal cuttings and we need to, and the distinction between those is critical. True clear cutting where things come in after the disturbance or seed tree, those systems just don't work. They just lead to problems and they will lead to type changes. Um, here's from Westfeld's monograph. You see different types of advanced regeneration. This of course is a very vigorous you know, ideal optimum size three, four foot tall uh, spruce seedlings just coming just two years after release cutting. Here we have what we call an umbrella tree. These flat top things can be very old, but they will uh, straighten up and form excellent trees. I know that some people don't believe that, but that's uh, this is a well documented phenomenon. So we need to conserve those as well. Now, I hope it'd be nice if we could just go on and talk about something else or talk a little bit about shelterwood cutting, but um, I need to, to, to back up a little bit and talk a bit about um, the, the, the legacy that began probably in the 1970s through about 1990 where foresters uh, just did not pay attention to these principles, uh, at least many didn't, or, and there were of course mitigating circumstances and that's again a long story, but the bottom line was uh, that during, especially during the, that, this period in the, during the budworm outbreak and slightly before it into the night, about 1990, we lost over 2 million acres of spruce fir uh, type in the state of Maine. And actually, if you go back to 1960, that's even longer. We're down to about half of what we once had just one half a rotation ago. Um, not good. Um, why did this happen? Okay. Um, th well, there's a number of causes, and let's just dissect them briefly with the idea of how we overcome them and, and don't repeat these mistakes. I think one cause was that we had stands you know, millions of acres of stands that were in stem exclusion, okay? They had no advanced regeneration under them. They were fully stocked. Um, what should have been done and was done in some cases, but not widely, was some kind of shelterwood establishment cutting. Uh, that just didn't happen for all kinds of reasons, to move the stand into understory reinitiation, okay? That was one problem. Of course, you can just clear cut those stands and plant whatever you want, and that is a viable option, especially if you have nothing but fur and you want to change that composition. That works fine, too. So that is where, clear, that's a pl place of clear cutting in this resource, is if you're going to use artificial regeneration. Just an example of a ni really nice uh, spruce uh, uniform shelterwood five years after the establishment uh, cutting on, um, over in western Maine. Um, 
if, you know, say there is small advance regeneration, it can, I think another major problem in the, in the 80s was this uh, essentially destruction of that through careless logging. There was just no ethic about controlled trail layout, which we have had now for the last uh, couple decades or so. Keep these feller bunchers, grapple skitters on less than 20% of the area, very tight, rigid, geometric pattern, and you will get decent stocking in the end. If you let them drive everywhere, it's a disaster. Even better, go to, uh, I, in my opinion, um, cut the link systems. I know there's a debate about whether they're good or bad. I mean, both of these systems with good discipline logging can do just fine. I like leaving the residues in the woods. Um, I realize we can't always do that. Here's, the, here's an example of where that didn't happen, right? And this was com all, you know, way too common in the 1980s. Here's uh, Chuck Gadzik, actually. We're out there on a, on a clear cut where the, the operator, whatever machine, had just, just completely driven over all the advanced growth. Right? There was even some people say, oh, we don't want even, you know, is this advanced regeneration? It's suppressed. It's 50 years old. We need to get rid of it and start over. Right? Well, that was just bad-headed thinking. That's not the way it works. Another shot from that same block. If you had to design a silvicultural system to wipe out spruce and fir, this is what you'd come up with. You'd go in and high grade out all the seed sources and stem exclusion. You'd drive over all the ground, and it's the perf perfect site prep for raspberry, white birch, red maple, all the things we don't want. You get the red maple and birch seed trees there to just complete the process. And this was way too common, and I don't know why people thought this was going to come back to spruce and fir, um, but it has not. That's, part, that's one acre right there of that two million. Now, in some cases, the logging in the winter, you know, the regeneration made it through the logging, but it was not established. So it was not in the mineral soil. There was too small. Um, so what's the remedy here? Just wait for understory reinitiation or do a shelter wood cutting, right? That's a, a, the recurring theme here. Also, if you're going to do, you know, I think systems that left residues well distributed over the site, the importance of the dead shade to early establishment was important, right? Dead shade is really valuable to those early seedlings. Not live shade. Live shade is, uh, is a competitor, but dead. That is not an established seedling. That spruce germinate in the, in the duff there. Nova Scotia has published some really nice guidelines here on this. Uh, here we have height classes. You know, we're using height as a surrogate for root development. Less than four inches, these are centimeters. Not established. You know, it's four to four inches to a foot or so. It's established, but it may not be competitive. Uh, once the overstory is removed, something a foot to breast height uh, is, they, is deemed to be ideal because it's biologically really well established, probably vigorous, and it's going to be competitive against uh, uh, other species when the overstory is removed. Greater than that is certainly uh, also, they're even better established, but they now you got to get into issues of it's much more difficult to avoid damaging these tall saplings. So there's sort of a window here, a sweet spot of, you know, right around five feet um, that, that, that where that works best. Um, the caveat here, though, is that in really good site classes, I think the spruce do have to have a taller like northern hardwood sites, try to keep them in mix, those mixed woods. You need to have them taller than breast height. But in any event, the, 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 they're, they need to be well established to be competitive. It, say it made it through, so we had strikes one through three there. We also have four. I mean, even though they made it through the harvest and became established, then they often got uh, you know, overtopped by raspberry, birch, uh, other competing vegetation. Um, the, 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 Remedy here is just to extend the regeneration period under a shelter wood method until you get that ideal height structure. So the better the site, the more head start is needed, which I just said earlier. If you don't do that, then timely herbicide release uh, is what's needed to accelerate succession. And of course, landowners rallied and did large acreages of that through the 80s. If they had not done that, we would have lost a lot more. Right? So you can do that too if you want, although I just think it's much simpler and straightforward to, now that we have the logging systems to do this extended shelter wood management. Here's an example of a, of a red spruce coming out of that umbrella stage you know, and responding to a natural canopy gap. Just, so just to recap, what went wrong? We had like a series of four things, basically. Dense natural stands, stem exclusion stage, in other words, no regeneration underneath them. Um, that was unprecedented. That had never happened in Maine forest before. This was an artifact or a consequence, I guess, of the earlier heavy cuttings, right? The stands were just middle-aged. Um, the advanced growth was present but got wiped out in the logging because of no discipline and or it survived and died from exposure, wasn't established, or uh, died under competition. So all of those were 
uh, it may, and actually in combination, where it helped explain that uh, sad period in Maine forestry. The simple remedy for all this is extended shelter with silviculture. If you just want to manage under an even age paradigm, that's all you need to do. It solves all these problems. I, I often advocate you make your establishment cut the first step where you're going to establish trees as light as you can do commercially. Something like 30, 35 percent is probably that number. Remove the overstory when the advanced growth reaches at least five feet, which is going to be 10 to 20 years under that canopy. You can even maybe do a partial reentry here, but you know, wind firmness can be a a problem so, and leave the stand heavy that will that will keep the intolerant competitors out um, and if you want to build structure and do other more you know elaborate uh, management of the growing stock you can certainly leave immature trees and that as reserves and or big legacy trees as we'll see later so that's simple now with the right logging systems it was hard in the 1980s I realize all the reasons this didn't happen but we've learned from that now people sometimes ask can we manage light to favor spruce um, well, the answer is, of course, yes, as we just explained, if we're trying to keep out intolerant competitors. We just use an extended shelterwood method. Um, no, however, uh, if we're trying to just favor spruce over fir and hemlock. And the, here we go to some research that we did uh, a little over a decade ago now on the Penobscot Forest where we studied height growth of the three species, fir, red spruce and eastern hemlock and uh, so what we see just for statistical reasons here we're, we're taking the log of the of the height growth of the tree so just ignore the numbers here just look at the pattern so we have there's the pattern of red spruce to increasing light in a log scale from very completely shaded on the left to virtually open on the right so 80 this 0.85 is almost 85 percent of full sun and you can see that under dense shade the red spruce is at a great disadvantage of against fir and hemlock. About somewhere in here, about 20, 15, 20 percent spruce goes by the hemlock, but it never goes by the fir. These basically they're equal from, you know, on the upper end of the spectrum here. So there isn't any way really to monkey around with just light to favor spruce. It's going to take more interventions. Um, here's for example in those PEF selection stands, here's a dense, think of hemlock regeneration, probably 20 years old from a past single tree selection cut. Every spruce in that little clump was dead and every hemlock was still alive. So this is what's happening. So even spruce as tolerant as is does not withstand that competition. It needs to be uh, daylighted at some point there. So the take home message here is very simple. We need to use a shelterwood method, regenerate in the shade, not in the open. Small to medium sized gaps are great, especially if you leave a light overwood in them. That's another way to do this if you're not doing uniform treatments. And I think the critical principle is to conserve and protect and favor advanced regeneration of all kinds, including those suppressed trees that many people think are not good growing stock. They have a height advantage. They're 10 or 20 feet tall. You cannot plant a tree next to them that will catch up with them, right, at that time. So that get rid of that uh, mindset. Here are just examples of it. Maybe, you know, very flat top, within five years that'll form a new leader, and within 20 years it'll have a, you know, two-thirds or higher crown ratio and just be way ahead of the competition down here. Same here, even, you know, even better, right, because that tree is much better. Leaf pole, even like, you know, here's an irregular shelterwood on Basque Egan where the foresters left you know, pole-sized trees that are just immature. Another very straightforward way to make sure that spruce is represented in the next stand. Cedar also here, you see on the right. A little case study here, just, I mean, it's hard, easy to find these things, unfortunately, examples, but this is one that's been followed pretty well. In the middle of 1980s, out on the Bureau of Public Lands in Maine, out in Duck Lake, they cut these wide, basically three chain wide strips. You can see them here on this Google Earth image. Um, if you go back there now and you look around on the ground, guess what happened? I mean, those, those were true clear cuts, and they're basically hardwood strips now in, in amongst the, the nice conifer residual strips that are still there. There's just, you know, lots and lots of land out there that was treated this way, okay? Mm -hmm. These were all beautiful, productive spruce first ends in 1960. Um, Recognizing this, of course, the future foresters like later came on later, like George Ritz and many others uh, entered the residual strips with just simple, sh you know, uniform shelter woods and got beautiful regeneration responses. So you got like complete night and day out there now. Makes a great trip for the students. Um, and just to make sure that not not everybody in Maine uh, got onto this clear cutting bandwagon that we were on in the 1980s, I think we had some really courageous people, Jensen Bissell and Chuck Gadzik, I would single out for 
you know, basically going against the grain, getting single grip harvesters working in the in the late 1980s, um, not uh, glomming onto a clear cutting paradigm, and figuring out how to get partial cutting done. And they they did. And there's a this is what we got 20 years later. Nice stands all over that, those uh, landscapes. Okay, regen. That's enough on regeneration. Um, let's uh, now talk about managing for commodities here, just briefly. Um, of course. Here we're trying to regenerate the full stocking because we don't want wasted growing space, and then we're going to be doing thinning, which is sort of the quantitative part of managing spruce firs. You know, this is where the numbers matter. We're going to probably pre-commercially thin, and now we're going to do commercial thinnings probably. Now, rather than get into details, which I do in my class, I'm not going. I'm not going to do that, and part of it is because I think everybody's rethinking this now with the loss of markets for small diameter spruce fir pulp. But I think I, my, I would advocate much wider. Uh, spacings are much lower densities in that early stage, but that that's a work in progress, of course, as we're all facing. Let's just look briefly at the experience on the PEF here, Penobscot Forest. This is the three-cut shelterwood out there, which was very effective, of course, for for the reasons we just described, at keeping that spruce fir forest, you know, in spruce fir without any herbicide. Okay, so the overstories were moved in the late 60s in this this particular uh, compartment, and then. And this is what we have now. The red here on the bottom is red spruce, the green is fir, the white is hemlock, and then uh, the blue there is red maple. So very fact, very even age stand development with that uh, multi-stage overstory removal. And actually here they cut down all any residual trees over two inches. You go back there now, you got tremendous regeneration, but you've got there's been no spacing or other follow-on, and these these trees are are way way overstocked, obviously, and very you can find merchantable trees in there now at age 40, but they're not. You can never thin it effectively because those would be your crop trees, right? You'd want to be cutting all this two and three inch stuff with no market. So this is still at age 40 inoperable. Um, just to, if you look at that block uh, from Google Earth, look at this. This is a, this is a vivid illustration of managed regeneration versus the commercial clear cut treatment and the PEF. There's just this distinct line, and we of course lead tours through this all the time. It just it's just so vivid that it's it's wonder how we ever lost track of this. But anyway, thanks to Bob Frank and his predecessors at the PEF, we have these nice long-term experiments. Even better, now say we do this and we pre-commercially thin that regeneration, which was done on half of the block in the early 1980s. Okay, so we come in, take out, try to favor spruce. You can see here we got a bit more spruce back, but the stand is still at least half fur. Um, this is the only treatment of everything that's in the PEF that actually increased the stocking of spruce. Okay. Um, it's remarkable, and then we've done it further. We've came in here right after this. This is a short trend here. We've now got data another 10 years and did commercial thinnings that, that pushed this even more towards spruce. None of the other treatments have been able to do that, including the single tree selection, and that's a whole other long story too, which I've left out of this that we could go into. Um, here's the stand, eight to nine foot spacing or so at age, the spacing was done at age 10. This is what it looks like at age 30. So you, everything there is merchantable. You can cut that. Um, of course, pre-commercial thinning is basically, a, it's an attempt to just bring that those trees to merchantability much sooner than they would otherwise. You also get a cleaning benefit, in other words, changing the composition away from fur if you do it uh, well. And thirdly, and I think this is a, also a very important thing, you're going to build wind firmness for later partial entries. Um, see, I have a typo there. Uh, there, you know, that's something that we didn't have in those in the 1980s that we couldn't take advantage of. And here we are, 12-inch spruce at age 40, beautiful. Um, after commercial thinning, we got we have 14-inch fir out there now in in uh, age 40 to 45, and that stand is now mature. So if you want to really accelerate the rotation, you can do it. These trees are just, I mean, I, every year I go out there, I expect these to be gone, either dead from the adelgid or blown over, but they're still standing. And once if they don't do that, they grow about an inch every two years. So. Um, and, but, and clearly this is a case where we ought to remove this fur soon and leave the spruce as reserves and try to regenerate this understory. Okay, that's a, uh, I could go on much. I have a whole lecture on production forestry that gets into all kinds of details. But I want to now move on and wrap up here with um, sort of this ecological forestry paradigm and irregular shelter, which, which I know is very much on a lot of people's minds throughout the region as we're trying to you know, really create, as Tony went into last week, some really robust, diverse uh, uh, forests that will resist the, these seemingly, um, uh, you know, dynamics that are hitting us now that we didn't used to deal with. Okay, a little basic ecology. Uh, it, we all, I think, realize that worked here that 
gap dynamics is by far the dominant disturbance regime here, right? We got these long live shade tolerant species that live for centuries. Um, stand replacing events in the natural forest were rare, very rare actually, in the point where they were maybe stands under, even age stands under 75, Craig Lorimer found were dominated about 15% of the northern main landscape in 1820 uh, to 30, pre settlement. That's of course shifted wildly. Humans made the landscape up there much more even age, and that was part of the thing that set up all the regeneration problems in the 80s. But, but the natural forest is very different. Okay, it's driven by gap dynamics. So if you're going to use the natural dynamics as a as an eco as a framework to devise a silvicultural system, then you're going to have to use some kind of multi-age uh, system, multi-age stand structures with a significant component of old trees. Okay. You can still make money, you can still harvest products, but then you have to you have to do this a bit differently. So you're going to be regenerating in small gaps and patches within irregular stands. The whole idea of having uniformity, we need to get rid of that. Um, so the question is then, as we start thinking about teaching and managing multi-age forests, we have to have some kind of a target stand structure. Um, there are two ways to do this. Uh, there, you can do this by diameter or you can do it by area. Diameter, of course, this reverse, this sainted reverse J-shaped curve, the so-called BDQ method, where we, you know, we use a B, we create this mathematical structure and look for deficits and so forth, um, has been around a long time. Um, it, I think, it's descriptive of the structure of these stands, but I don't think it's particularly informative about their dynamics. Um, and you know, I just don't like it. And and it would take another half an hour to an hour to explain why using data from the PEF. Just accept me for now because I want to spend the time moving on to what I think is a better alternative, what is natural. Um, we have uh, you know lots of disturbance in this new emerging field. Well, it's not really. It's 25 years old now really of disturbance ecology that's led to um, you know real working hypotheses about our forest types that we have here. So we need data on disturbance rates, patch sizes, and post-disturbance legacies. So that what to inform our silviculture. Here we turn to a great work of Sean Fravor when he was a PhD student here. He's now, of course, back on our faculty as the forest ecologist. Sean studied the Big Reed Reserve in northern Maine and developed what we call a disturbance chronology back for 200 years in these old growth forests. So this is just an age structure of that percent of the total area in each of a series of decades that are essentially a 200 year long paradigm. You can see most are represented. These are truly multi-age forests. We have spruce, mixed wood, hardwood, all types. And here's the remarkable thing. If you take the long-term average of those, it's 10% per decade with variation, of course, you know, as you would have any in any situation for 180 years. So 1% per year, 10% per decade. So this becomes a guiding principle of this. So great contribution. Um, and other studies have confirmed that too, actually. So, um, so when we, so we got these natural disturbance parameters, what are their silvicultural analogs? Well, the disturbance rate is the cutting cycle combined with the percent of the stand regenerated in an entry. Okay, the product of those things is gonna be is going to give you that disturbance rate uh, that you're trying to emulate. The, the patch size, of course, is just the size of groups we're making when we make these uh, we, these uh, gap cuttings, and they're they're sort of not not just their size, but how they're oriented relative to each other. And then the biological legacy idea of Franklin's and others is basically you need to designate permanent reserve trees in the gaps, right? Not in the matrix between the gaps. Uh, you don't. The only uh, Retention and legacy that matters is where you're regenerating. In this case, since that's happening in the gaps, you have to do it there. Otherwise, you will eventually have no retention. Okay. So here's what we did. The one I come up with, I could, just to make this easy to remember, the one percent rule. Okay. Um, so within the stand area, the area should be fall within the natural boundary. So they just multiply one percent by your cutting cycle. So you would have a 10-year cutting cycle. Then you would regenerate 10 percent of the stand in gaps every decade or 20% every 20 years, et cetera. Very simple. Um, patch size. The natural sizes are, were very small from single trees up to maybe a tenth of a hectare or a quarter acre. Um, larger patches that we're using in one of our treatments, as we'll see in a minute, uh, depart from that a little bit, but they're still way preferable to, you know, to stand wide uniform treatments if you're trying to restore this irregular structure. So you have to think, you have to get rid of the old idea that we're going to try to make every stand uniform and we're going to map this out in aerial photos and have these little polygons. We just need 
I think we need to learn to deal with bigger stands that have a lot of within stand diversity and map stands based on enduring features like site quality, landscape things, not some artifact of the past disturbance, um, which is the way we're heading here. And then finally, you know, we need to designate these reserve trees as they're do as, a, as the gaps are created, not in the whole stand. This is that's what makes this really easy. And then, then what this will do then is that as those gaps regenerate, those gaps then will take on this very irregular old growth-like structure once the smaller trees catch up with the big ones. That's something that would not have been there otherwise. Um, we just arbitrarily pick 10% of the original stocking, which in this these stands are about 15 square feet, focusing on big trees. But that this number is absolutely arbitrary. It was something we picked a, so that we could basically still harvest 90% of the production and try to come up with a commercially viable system. What do we call this? Okay, so this was built basically on. Um, natural disturbance parameters. We did not go to the silviculture cookbook and look something up and try to plug it in. That's, of course, the way I was trained by Dave Smith, and that's the way he viewed it. The terminology should be descriptive, not prescriptive. So this bin then becomes, we do have a name for this, it's shelterwood with reserves, but just in patches. So it becomes a group shelterwood, in other words, where the entire stand then would contain examples of all stages. The age structure is going to vary spatially. This is an old system. This goes back to the 1800s. It's called Famelschlag in, in Europe. The Germans, there's the Bavarian variant of the Famelschlag where you make small patches and then gaps and you expand those out over time. This is when I saw this in 1993, the light came on. I said, we should be, you know, why can't we do this in May? Um, and why didn't we know about this before? I guess Smith had mentioned it to me. But uh, anyway, Klaus Putman and his, my friend at Oregon State wrote this wonderful, he and his colleagues, this critique of silviculture. And, he, the, the first chapter in that book is just excellent if you're into silvicultural history. Klaus, being a German native, basically critiqued what the early American silviculturists did and did not do. And I think Dave uh, elaborated on this. The early American silviculturists were just trying to get some kind of silviculture applied in, in, in North America. And so they these things like Famelschlag and some of the other more elaborate German systems just got, they knew about them, but they didn't put them in their books. So that just got kind of lost. So we've kind of resurrected it. Um, and then in the 90s, uh, there was all this stimulus to do some new, uh, you know, the originally it was new forestry, ecological forestry. So we created a research program which we had a strong desire to do, you know, a practical system that had strong ecological underpinnings. Some, in other words, the ecological underpinnings should be in any silvicultural system. I mean, because you know, for the concept of forest, the discipline of forest ecology is central to silviculture. Here we're talking. When we say ecological. We're talking more about natural disturbance, disturbance dynamics, and more contemporary use of that. Smith, Dave Smith used to, of course, always admonish us that you know, unless you you can do all the research you want, but if it doesn't show up in the woods, you haven't accomplished anything. So I have always had that uh, you know, my on the ball there. At least I've tried to. Um, and this is so the traditional ways that we used to manage multi-age stands with these DBH distributions, just people just aren't doing them because they're complicated. And I would argue lack an ecological basis. Again, a long story that we could go into if we had time. And plus, we had this, this discipline of disturbance ecology has now given us the understanding of these dynamics. So we can now apply it on this more simple area basis. So we created this, what I've come to call the Acadian Famelschlag and the Acadian Forest Ecosystem Research Program Study in 1994. We've just now doing the third entries in these. We just finished the one, one last week on the second replicate. So we have our 1% disturbance frequency over 100 years. We have our small substand gaps uh, expanded on a 10 or 20 year cutting cycle and 10% retention dispersed throughout the entire stand in the gaps. Okay. The first of these, we have two treatments. One would be an irregular group shelter wood with reserves. These what sometimes we could just call this our large gap treatment. The other one, as we'll see in a minute, is this more of a classic group selection, small gaps. Here's a visualization of the way this looks, the actual replicate you populated with Envision. The group shelter wood, we do 20% a decade for five entries and then 50 years of stand tending, no more regeneration. So this is front loaded. Over a 100 year period, this is 1% per year. But since we're starting with an old 100 year old stand, it hasn't any treatment in a long time, you know, just so we don't lose too much, we're doing this. It's sort of accelerated disturbance, although, you know, still pretty benign. Half acre gaps expanded every decade. So we're, you know, that's, those are the parameters and permanent retention in the gaps of 10% roughly 15 square to base area. 
this applies to both. The other, the group selection is just a half speed version of this, 10% per decade forever. So we're trying to create a truly balanced within stand structure on a 100 year cycle. The gaps are half the size and we expand them every two decades instead of one. So it's just, again, it proceeds at about half the pace of this. So this would be interesting. I wish I could live another 50 or 100 years to see how this is actually going to come out. But that's probably not going to happen. Hopefully somebody will follow this. Um, uh, here's just an example of a, a map of the actual uh, research block, and you, this is the, the the darkest color here of the uh, expansions we did. This is this is one we cut last winter. You can see the lightest or the original gaps expanded out here. Notice we don't do this symmetrically. We try to block this in. Um, you can see the skid trails here. One nice feature of this that I got from the Germans, and it's absolutely true. Trails are a small part of the area, and you can stay out of the regeneration. Basically, you don't have, once you create these gaps, you, you move out and you, and you harvest around the edge. You never drive through it like you would in a uniform system. Beautiful. Here's the one we just cut. You can see in the showing through here in the crosshatch of the original gaps. This is the large gap. This is the small gap over here on the right. The, the, yeah, the uh, blue were the ones that were done 10 years ago. And again, you can see they, Mike Saunders, who was running this then, blocked those in, and then we did the same thing again expanded out here in the yellow, trying to keep the matrix intact. This, this block here is now 60% regenerated with reserves in the gaps, 40% matrix, mostly hemlock in this case. This one's only 30% regenerated, but it's you know working pretty well. Um, here, just some pictures of how these look. Here's is a gap. Now, this doesn't look like a gap to some people because there's trees out there. Well, that's the idea. This is tall regeneration. There's a hemlock out there, a beautiful spruce, 10 feet tall, whatever else. There's pine all through these. And taller, true legacy reserve trees, like this big old uh, sugar maple on the left, which we don't have much of. Um, that's one gap, and that's coming out just exactly right. Here's one that just picture taken last week where the, before the forwarder moved the wood roadside and in a gap expansion. And you can see that's just not, we're not going back to bare ground. We're leaving spruce growing stock here that's immature that will last another 50 years at least until we're back in there. Okay, so that, think of that. So you got legacy, big, Ecological thing, issues are going to stay forever, but we also have these uh, this immature growing stock that we can leave for a long period of time, and just think of it as tall regeneration. We don't have to just cut all that all down. We can leave it and release it because it will, and the Acadian forest respond. We did earlier cuts with the cable skitter, but this time, you know, uh, we're we're doing it mechanically with beautiful results. You know, we have a, this operator is incredibly skilled. This Ponzi Ergo is a wonderful machine. Any kind of cut the link system will just do a great job here. Here we are in the matrix looking out at a gap. You want to keep, you know, you don't, we don't thin the matrix. We want to keep this intact. So as we moved into it, otherwise, if you thin through this, you're going to create a shelter wood over the whole block. That's not what you want to do, okay? Uh, just a, here's the gap. Here we have uh, tall regeneration, the first entry. Here's the, here's where the skitter drove, and here's where we did the overstory removal in the first expansion, taking advantage of that side light, right? So again, you're not, you may drive through a little pattern, but you're basically staying out of all the regen here if you do that uh, skillfully. What's regenerating is somewhat predictable based on the advanced regeneration of the fir and hemlock that was there, but we're also getting in these expansion zones lots of pine and spruce. We also have hardwood sprouts. Um, underneath the reserve tree, so it's just, it's, but it's keeping definitely the coniferous mix. Uh, pine, because we're leaving large pine trees as reserves, but of course they also serve as seed trees. Pine stocking has come in everywhere. It's just a remarkable, and this we regard as an excellent thing. And clearly, th some of these gaps would benefit from early tending. We've not yet done that. Um, we plan to. Uh, there, a little bit on the reserve trees. Again, I, this was 10. 10 percent or 15 square feet of basal area, you know, uh, tend to dominate by large trees, hemlocks, and things that are rare. Here we see a large, big white pine. Um, anything with wildlife use, cavities, uncommon species, all the, the usual reasons you would retain something that's special, right? Um, and then there's the growing stock kind of trees, the long, the sort of what we come to call overwood trees or the tall regeneration. So all of this gets retained, um, either for strictly ecological reasons or for a future value or both. Um, it's simple to do this, prescribe this. If you're unsure quantitatively, you just take your 15 bath prism out there and you should see a tree anywhere you are in the gap. You know, and you can clump them if you want. I'd like to disperse them. Um, we didn't know anything about how these trees would fare. I just had a graduate student finish uh, a census of 820 of these things and the whole three replicate experiment. 
after 20 years, 92. This is an extraordinary number, and I I'm just astonished by this. Uh, pleasantly surprised. 92 percent of those trees are still alive. Many species um, had 100 percent survival. Okay. Um, hemlock, 97 percent. Sugar maple, uh, red maple, 97 percent of them are, out of 120 are still standing out there, and of course they're growing. Um, yellow birch. The worst was actually uh, quaking aspen, uh, 67 was pretty good, cedar was the lowest of the conifers, mostly because they, they toppled over on wet soils. Red spruce, this is the most amazing, well, most of these spruce we exposed are just going to go over, 88% of them are still standing there, right, and growing. We've lost some, but that's part of the, the ecological process. It's extraordinary how many of them have survived. And there's just something about the aerodynamics of these trees and gaps that's very different than when you leave them out in the middle of a big even age block and, and, and in a way that really does favor their long lives. So let me just wrap up here by the, summarizing what I think the advantages of these area-based structures are. Ecologically, you're managing regeneration deliberately um, rather than by assumption of future ingrowth, is what, which is what happens with the diameter approach. So you actually focusing on gaps and the rates and how much they're in there and you can go find it and manage it if you need to plant trees even the sustainability is guaranteed since we know what the disturbance parameters is if we as long as we stay within that area wise we're we we're just inherently sustainable ecologically right we don't need to assume uh, any relationship between size and age which is a critical feature and usually uh, an Achilles heel of that BDQ approach. Usually the small trees in these stands are not younger like the, the BDQ thing requires, right? So they're just as, as old. Again, I could elaborate on that. What are, now, th so we got those ecological advantages, but I think the operational advantages, I, many, many of you foresters out there can re readily relate to these things. The layout's very straightforward and simple, especially with modern GIS and GPS technology. When we first did this, I was out there with a hip chain. Now we go out there, you know, we sort of do a walk around, come back, work on the on the, the GIS a bit, and then go back and put that on the ground and tweak it. Lay out the trails, give the operator a shape file, and, and off we go. Uh, it's just beautiful, very simple. Um, everything's focused on small percentage of the stand. You don't need to work out through the whole stand. You don't need all the, the, the mensurational stuff that you need with a BDQ. You don't need to pre-harvest uh, DBH distribution or keep a tally. You can, if you're going to model this, we've got trees that are in these sort of young, even age patches that's much more straightforward and the models work better for that than they do in the more irregular stands. And you can actually do a light harvest, right? You can do a 25% removal. That's feasible. Right? You cannot go in any stand now. I challenge anybody to go running around with mechanical systems removing tw the 25% the, the of the trees that you want to remove. 20% is going to be in the trail. So you may have a little leverage, but not very much. So this is much better. What have we learned? I just think these gap systems are, are viable. I mean, Mike Saunders and his grad student, Justin Arsenault, wrote a about this in the Journal of Forestry a couple of years ago, and there be, we're seeing you know fairly widespread application of these little by little on public forests and family forest owners throughout the region. Less so certainly on large landowners. Um, and really, the more I follow and manage these experiments, the more encouraged I become about them. I just think that the regeneration patterns, which we're now studying in detail, uh, you know, now that we've got the reserve trees, are, are just going to be very encouraging. I think we're making very positive shifts that, here. Ecologically, we need more ecologists to come and study these, uh, whatever. Um, I, d I have to say, as much as I sometimes get so enthusiastic about this stuff, this is not a panacea. That's another Dave Smith thing. There is no silvicultural panacea that will work everywhere. You know, if you have nothing but short life species, you just obviously this is not going to last. So, you know, let's find something else to do there. Okay, this is done. Here's some references that I've built this on um, that I think is attached as a PDF for you. I can't stop without acknowledging some of the people that had an immense impact on me and my career. Of course, Dave, for giving me a great education and mentoring. My longtime friends and colleagues, Max McCormick, Gordon Mott, who came here, who when I showed up here in the late 70s, um, you know, just looked after me and taught me a tremendous amount. And they're both, I still treasure their friendship and, and their collegiality. Um, Mac Hunter, of course, and another old friend who, together with Mac, we sort of devised all this ecological forestry ideas and put them on the ground. Laura Kenefick, scientist for the U.S. Forest Service, who's you know graciously shared you know 60 years of data, so we collaborate on all kinds of stuff. And my colleague and Sean Fravor in the ne office next to me, who has really made his quantum leaps in the understanding of the natural disturbance dynamics. 
And finally, you know, my friends and fellow foresters, they're way too numerous to name here, George Ritz, Jensen Bissell, many others that have actually gone out and done this stuff and proven that's not just ivory tower. I've learned a great deal from all of them working together. And finally, the NSRC that, that's funded some of my research here. So that will do it. Um, we should, in a perfect world, we would not go out in the forest and see these things, but I think that's, that will have to await another time. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. And we do have a few questions that have come in, so I'll go ahead and, uh, and, and read those off right now. The first one is uh, going back to your uh, point about skid trails. Uh, does that mean that you don't have permanent skid trails in these areas? In the, uh, um, it's, let's go up and see if we can look at the picture. Um, yeah. uh, the answer to that is yes and no. It's some are permanent. They're, you like in any system. So here was an artery that we just wanted to reuse, and it was on the edge of these gaps. So it's basically bounding that. Um, but if you look here, there's a bunch of, uh, from the previous operation, here's the landing we had. Uh, to get these blue blocks up here. We ran a whole series of cable skitter trails down to this landing. I just stayed out of those and we ran up through here and then sent one trail off through the new uh, expansion zones, right, so to let these heal. So when we've modeled this out, it, do it really does uh, minimize on the, uh, the trail footprint. If you, I mean, we could have reused all these, but then, you know, in the end, we'd end up with something like we get in a typical uniform shelterwood with, I think, too much area and trails. We'll see. So, yeah, the, so the, yes, we do use some, uh, but no, not all of them. Great. Uh, um, another question, uh, and just before I read this one off, just a reminder to folks, we do have a few more minutes, so if other folks have questions, please go ahead and, and send those in. Um, a question from Bill, and I have to admit my German is, uh, is I, I never took German, so um, I, I'll do my best on the pronunciation, uh, but as has anyone studied the GNI or financial performance of the Femmelschlag, or applied it? Uh, yeah, Femmelschlag. Yes, um, that paper of Saunders and Arsenault does that. Actually, they looked at the uh, the economics of it and compared it to more classical or you know straightforward like single you know, or say regular shelterwood and maybe single tree selection using data from the PEF, and it it really compares quite favorably. Um, not that that couldn't be done. I mean, we just, uh, the, it's, pr you know, it's probably not in any of these systems of partial cutting, no matter how you look at them, it's, uh, the economics are always going to favor heavy early cuts, right? So the more of that wood that you take, the higher the present value, you know? So you have to constrain it to some ecological or silvicultural or landowner objective kind of constraint. And then the question is, what if you're going to do some irregular kind of management, what's the best way to proceed? And, and that's when you make that comparison, this gap business is just way ahead of the single tree approach. Um, it's not going to out yield or outperform monetarily something that's, you know, a heavy uniform shelter wood over the whole thing with a overwood removal in five years. Of course, that's going to win in present value. So you have to, if, but if it's constrained, then uh, the gaps work. We get full stumpage payments for these gaps. The operators love these things. He just cut three, over 300 cords in four and a half days out here in that Ponzi. This was, there were no obstacles to his productivity in this. There are many clear cuts after all. Once you get the machine in there, it, he just works on these trails. We lay everything out for him and, and it's done in a week. Seven and a half acres done in a week and you know we get the full freight on that. So yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, another question from Nicole, as GAP continues to expand, uh, how to prevent equipment from damaging regeneration in the system? Do you use a permanent well, trail network? Um, we tend to, like this trail here would probably not get reused, so I think we, we always try to, to lay out the trails through the expansion zones, not through the previous gaps. So you can see what we did here. Um, Right, this is going through the the expansion zone, so there will be an impact there. But there's still, you know, that this is going to regenerate some on its own after the harvest. Right, next time we'll probably come up through here, and this will be allowed to to rest. So you just basically always do careful layout, trying wherever you can to to move your trails over away from the gaps. So the way the Germans would do it, that they have this more geometric system there where I, I believe, I don't know, something like 300 feet apart, you have these truck, you know, tra truck uh, where they'd haul the wood out of, and then they would use 
powerful winches to basically winch all their wood to these trails. So you would start in the back, right, in the middle, and then gradually cut towards the road so you'd never be yarding through that. That's the way they do it. We, we have this ground-based system where we drive around more. So we have to, so I think more and more I'm thinking we just have to, uh, don't reuse the trails as, as much as possible. Let them heal and have new ones that we use one time coming through what was formerly uncut matrix. Be my advice. Great. Thank you, Bob. A question from Patrick. We see a lot of red rot in spruce as it approaches 100 years of age here in Vermont, and are they're very susceptible to wind damage. Do you have these same issues in Maine? Um, that's very site dependent. Of course, white spruce is notoriously susceptible to this. So for, I mean, I don't know if, we're, if we have a species here. I I've intentionally didn't talk about white spruce and black spruce here, which of course are other two species. Um, so white, if it's white spruce, then yeah, I think this, uh, everything I said about red spruce doesn't apply. White spruce can be very productive, but it's much shorter life. Sort of, it's like a hybrid between red spruce and fir. If it's red spruce, I think, um, that's probably an old field. I think these root rotted spruces are probably, it's their old pastures. And I think I remember, and this, I can't prove this, but I think versus stands that are always forested. This is probably where I, we, if we had a follow up question, it would be helpful. But um, if it's this old field, it doesn't surprise me too much. If it's land that was always forested, that seems at age 100, seems a little early to me. Um, something happens in an agriculture where some of the microflora, I think, that compete with these naturally in the forest floor uh, with these uh, more destructive fungi um, and keep them in check. And the, in the, after land is plowed or heavily grazed, I think those things go away for a while. Um, <clears throat> Ifomies uh, in pine plantations, I know, I, for I'm thinking back to the Keene Forest and the, of Yale's in uh, southwestern New Hampshire. The, all the old field stands there, red pine, tend to develop foamies when they were on old fields. But land that was always forested and cleared and planted had no such issues. So, um, yes, and I think if they have a very, also if they have a very even age open grown origin like they would have in an old field, and, and I own property like this actually, and we're harvesting a lot of spruce like that now, and they're about 100 years old. If they've grown to be 18 inches, 20 inches, it's probably time to take them if they've, you know, served their purpose to, of seed bearing, right, and shade for the regeneration. I think the, the most important thing is to really try to hold on to them to the last cutting, not cut them in the first entry, otherwise you don't have your seed production. So. Great. Thanks, Bob. And I'd, uh, a follow-up comment from Patrick saying that, yes, it is old sheep pastures. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, a yeah. question here from Richard. The system you presented seems less data-driven and more on-the-ground observations, foresters managing acre by acre. Is that the case? Um, less data-driven. It, it's less, da it's, uh, as I mentioned, it doesn't require pre-harvest diameter distributions. I think you would still, in applying this, still have to keep track of the overall stocking with, you know, sampling points and so forth. Um, it's probably true that we, uh, once the original gaps were in and we, we sort of just walk around them and decide in which direction to expand them, usually not, you know, symmetrically. You can see here we're not um, doing that around the complete uh, perimeter. Um, that's yeah. That's that's field intuition and skill. Not you know. But looking for the data there is this not something that's numerical? If the data is the presence of advanced regeneration of desirable species that have come in underneath that side light that we want to release. So um, the other data, the other critic, the two other two data points would be the you know if you're trying to hit a quantitative retention target, you do have to measure that as you lay out the gaps. <clears throat> so you know. We've done it research-wise by actually, you know, it's easy, to, of course, to calculate the area of these zones in, in your GIS and then multiply by that, uh, you know, fifth, the stocking level to, to see how much retention you actually need in that. Or you can just take your prism out, like I mentioned, and do that. Um, and then the, I guess the other data thing would be the, uh, you know, just the areas. If you want to, I mean, there's no, we do this for research-wise. We try to stay right on the prescription, 20%. You wouldn't have to do that. There's There's no sort of police out there enforcing this r very rigid, you know, 10%, 20% per decade. If for some reason you wanted to do 30%, that would ecologically in smaller gaps, that'd probably work just fine, you know. It's, but that, the, the main thing is to keep 
in mind what the parameters of the prescription are and then it sort of adhered to them over the course of a, a time period that would be multiple entries, right? A sort of a ro the equivalent of a rotation. So yeah, yes and no. I guess there is data. It's a different kind than we Great. might Thank be used to. Sorry to cut you off, Bob. Thank you so much. Well, and, and I see a bunch more questions coming in, so I'm going to try to get to as many of these as I can. Um, a question here from Mark uh, that he says, I have a stand that is 95% fur at 60 years. It's probably not possible to get it, get more red spruce regenerating. Would you suggest a regular shelter wood or expanding gap? It is highly wind prone. Any thoughts on a situation like that? I think, yeah, yeah, somebody had to ask that question. That, <laughs> that's, as I've suggested, I think this is where you have nothing but short-lived, inherently short-lived growing stock. Uh, you know, cutting just a small fraction of the area is probably not going to work. I think there, I, of course, the first thing to do is to conserve at all costs whatever non-fur you have, if it's desirable, like if you do have some spruce or pine or cedar scattered around out there, conserve that. Um, don't leave them in giant gaps, you know, try to maybe protect them in clumps or something, just to, just as a restoration measure down the road. I, I think, guess I, you know, if you really wanted to shift that away, then you either could decide, okay, well, maybe this is where we could make some heavy patch cuts and just, con if the soils are really good, con you know, if it's old field that wants to go to northern hardwood, then you could move it that direction. If it's softwood land, though, more poorly drained and it needs it wants to grow softwood, then, then you get locked into this fur after fur cycle. Um, it's amazing. You have, it's, if it's made it to 60, you're already on borrowed time, at least my experience around here certainly seen older stands, but that's that one's already going to be falling apart. So there's no way you have time to go through a like a 50-year regeneration process without losing a great deal. So I might, in that case, depends on if it's like for a client or something, I, you could probably get, here in Maine at least, you could get and, and, a, and the cost sharing from the feds, NRCS, right, uh, to do some enrichment planting of and I, I'm not sure I'd plant red spruce in that case. You can buy seedlings, I guess. I would probably put in more white pine, which would be probably, if you look at the climate scenarios, it'd be more robust in the long run. I understand there's weevil issues. We'll talk about white pine next month, but uh, I really like enrichment planting of those things and even some maybe some hardwood species like red oak if the soils were good enough, if you really wanted to do that. But that's a much more expensive uh, proposition, and it won't. the gaps won't work probably, um, no. Great. Well, just um, hoping to get in at least one or two more questions here. Um, the follow-up question about the Femelscheig, uh, I how to apply this technique to young stands or intervene on OSR stage under traditional even age management systems. I assume that in a young spruce fir dominated stand, the initial entry would be a thinning throughout to favor spruce, though not necessarily past yeah. patches. That's right, and that would be a very common condition throughout northern Maine now. I mean, stands have been gone through and regenerated, and sometimes there's legacy structures. Uh, um, yeah, what to say about that? I think that you know, what the real entries here are down the road. Um, I think whatever you can do with tending treatments um, to build up the stocking of longer live species, that's really, after all, what makes this work, right? You want to, you have to, when you start it, and maybe you would start it a little more prematurely. These stands here, just because that's what we had to work with, are eight, we're 90, 100 years old at the beginning, right? We could have done it probably in 60, 70-year-old stands because um, we had sea bears and advanced regeneration. The fur had fallen out of these stands. That's where our initial gaps actually ended up in many cases. But, yeah, I think it's a viable practice, especially, I suppose, you know, actually, I think, you know, for northern Maine conditions, I think this is the system to manage deer yards. I wish I could convince biologists of this, and maybe they are. I don't haven't really talked to them directly. We have some active research going on now. Rather than these old, they mean these recommend these big patch cuts. Most of those just went to hardwood. And now you've lost your cover. If you do it this way with a shelterwood process, still in patches, still keeping like we see here on the screen, you know, ribbons of matrix and cover, we could stretch this out over a set of 50-year period, over a 100-year period. Now you got the perfect deer management system. So you're actually harvesting products from these prioritizing patches of fur, leaving longer life cedar and spruce, et cetera, and it's a great system rather than just doing nothing or doing things that aren't going to regenerate. So anyway, that's probably enough on that. Great, and um, and maybe if I can just slide one more in here. Uh, sure. Where red spruce is on slopes or higher elevation, um, how would you recommend recommendations change? 
um, slope. So the, that really steep side hill ground, of course, then you get into logging issues, right? Uh, oh, um, I think the ecological principles will work just fine up there. I think the higher, depends on whether you're talking about real mountain spruce, which is stuff that's up at the, close to 3,000 feet down to 2,500 and higher, or just steep ground that has spruce on it. I think uh, those I think those higher elevation stands probably were driven a little bit more by wind and were probably somewhat more even aged and probably ecologically would have somewhat larger patches. Um, John Battles and Faye did, at Cornell did some studies of this over in the White Mountains and I think that's what they found. <clears throat> You know, you get icing effects like the causes the fur waves and so forth. So you might get, I probably tend to think of larger patches. I, You know, the probably the retention would not fare as well on those conditions just because they're so wind-driven systems. But on the other hand, I think as a restoration measure, I think the concept works fine. I mean, you want to conserve all advanced regeneration and do patchy overstory removal, trying to keep whatever matrix you have intact, I guess is what I'd do. Yeah. Great. Well, th there are some additional questions here, um, but uh, what I'll do, Bob, is uh, I'll go ahead and put these folks in touch with you, um, and yeah. uh, and and you can address. I'm happy their, to talk to whatever. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And and, and, uh, and so thank you so much. I, I recognize um, we're a little bit over 10:30, so uh, thank you everybody so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Bob, for yeah, your thank uh, you. time presenting, and thank you participants for taking the time out of your schedule to join us. Uh, I did want to share just a couple of quick reminders before we let you go this morning. Again, if you uh, have as you close out of the webinar system, we will you will be receiving a link to our evaluation survey. Please take a minute or two to fill that survey out. It does help us uh, plan for future webinars. Uh, you will also receive a reminder by email. So if you don't have time to do it um, as you close down your system this morning, um, please follow up uh, with, with the email that you'll receive. Uh, this is also the way that we will track your SAF uh, continuing education credits. And then lastly, uh, just a quick plug, uh, Bob will be back next month. Um, the, the series, as I mentioned in the introduction, this series does continue. Uh, and so Bob will be joining us on March 17th, and we'll be looking at the Eastern Pine System. So um, so thank you again, everybody, for taking the time to join us this morning, and uh, hope that you'll, you'll join us on March 17th uh, for the next installment on Eastern Pine. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day out there, and take care.